hate you so much, Adobe. Adobe, do you understand how much of a piece of shit I think you are? I'm loud. I'm coming in hot. Aw, oh, yay, look at this shit. Y'all are not ready for the three-shelf setup. It's kind of annoying because, like, the shelves on this one don't quite line up with the shelves on the other two. Welcome back, friends and foes alike. I am Matt Prisons, and it is time for me to discuss the 25 movies released in the year of our Lord 2023 that I watched. Uh, as with last year, I have saved this for the weekend of the Oscars. In fact, this will probably go up the day of the Oscars. Just because w when I get to the end of the year, I usually still have a pretty substantial list of stuff I still have not gotten to that I would like to talk about, so... Uh, yeah, I've, I've just decided that I'm gonna delay my movies of the year list until, uh, the Oscars, until the week of the Oscars. Got some soda with me, as, as per usual, I will be using this as an excuse to get through some weird sodas. This one might... I was gonna say this one might be flat, it's been sitting there for a while, but, uh, it just bubbled over. This might not be flat, because it's been sitting there so long. That looks good. I don't know, I've, I've, I've had this shit... Upwards of a year, I want to say. I have had this upwards of a year. I mean, it seems a little off, but I don't even know that I can blame that on, like... I, I think it's just, it's this, this, the nitro Pepsi. It makes it, like, smoother. So I think maybe it's, like, the nitro that's making that seem a little off. A little more off than, than normal. That held. That held well. Damn. Good work, Pepsi. Oh, I, I forgot to mention, we're, we're doing away with, like, the half-star ratings this year. Uh, we're going Anthony Fantano style. It's, it's, like... Uh, light five, five, strong five, right? They're all fives, but a strong five's a little closer to being a six. A light five's a little closer to being a four. Five's kind of right in the middle there. So it, it, we're going Anthony Fantano style this year. Uh, I'm going to be taking these from the one I liked the least to the one I liked the most. Uh, starting with one of the most obvious last place picks... Probably the most obvious last place pick I've ever done for one of these lists. Coming in at number 25, it's Lady Ballers. Um, the new... Edgy, offensive comedy from from the Daily Wire. I don't know. They promoted this. Oh it's, like, oh, it's the most offensive comedy movie in years. And then they bleeped out the word fuck. Ben Shapiro has a cameo, and he says the word fuck twice, and they bleep it out both times. Like, come on. So, so Lady Ballers, in case you've never heard of this film, uh, God bless you if you haven't. Uh, it's, it's, some guys decide to go out for women's baths, some, some guys decide they're gonna dress up as women and go out for women's basketball, because the the trans because the trans people are allowing this and no one is gonna stop them because uh, because of wokeness because the woke culture won't let you say transphobic things guys you are allowed to you guys you guys should know you're allowed to say transphobic shit you guys say transphobic shit all the fucking time and that is that is to me the most glaring issue with this movie and this th this is like one of my biggest problems with the film there's this whole team of basketball players like pretending to be trans women and not once in the entire film do they face any sort of transphobia like, right, like, not not that I expect them to obviously that would like go against sort of the message, the idea of the movie, which is that, like, woke culture won't call out trans people for, for being wrong. But, I don't know, it feels wildly unrealistic that no one, no one has a problem with this. 
Ted Cruz shows up to one of their games and is just like, yeah, I'm fine with this. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's transphobic. Decidedly transphobic. But, I, I mean, it's it's selling itself on its transphobia, you know? And, and I mean, listen, like, the movie is bad. Apart, apart from the transphobia, the movie is bad. The movie is very... It's v- poorly written, poorly shot... A lot of it strokes the directors. The the writer director star of this movie, Jeremy Boring. His name is fucking boring, man. I can't make this shit up. Uh the writer director star Jeremy Boring takes several instances to stroke his own ego in this film. But that said, you might remember I came on and talked about the Daily Wire's first movie, Run Hide Fight, a few years ago. And I was really bored by that film. (laughs) Incidentally, the one not made by Mr. Boring, the more boring movie. Because it wasn't wasn't political. It didn't have, like, a whole bunch of dumb conservative shit. It was bad advice for dealing with a school shooter. But, like, apart from that, there was nothing really offensively conservative about it. Where this one, it's like, this is the type of bullshit I expect from the Daily Wire. This, when you say a Daily Wire movie, Lady Ballers is exactly what pops into my head when you say that. So on, on the one hand, it absolutely gave me what I wanted in, in a way that Run, Hide, Fight did not. And this may sound weird... There's like two or three jokes that land in... The, more jokes land in this one than I was expecting. Like, I, I have definitely seen worse comedy films than this. Honestly, if it, if it weren't for the transphobia, if this were like a movie from the 90s, and it were it was just like a men's basketball team pretends to be a women's basketball team, and there was no reference to trans people whatsoever, this would be like a 3 out of 10 um, the it's it's it really is the transphobia pulling it down to a one. Yeah, this one's a strong one. It's close to not being a one. If it wasn't transphobic, it it probably would not be. Not that it would receive a good score if it was not transphobic. It is still a bad movie. The thing that brings it down to a one is just the fact that it's transphobic. That it's so blatantly, openly transphobic. I mean, it's it's exactly what you expect. It's exactly what it says on the tin, you know. Granted, the tin says transphobia, but it's it's what you expect, okay? It is it is ev- there there are, there are no twists here. There are no oh wow, I didn't expect them to. No, this this is exactly what you are expecting from this movie. I, I came in, I was like, all right, Daily Wire, offend me, and the Daily Wire went transphobia and it's like yeah okay transphobia offends me but it's like your one thing find something new find a new way to be offensive come on like this like everything everything in this movie all the transphobic shit in this movie is stuff that has been said a million times over like, it's, you've heard it. You've heard it all before. It is tired. This is the most tired commentary on trans people you could possibly imagine. And, and, it's disgusting. And, let's, let's also be clear. Transphobia. Bad. I don't like the transphobia. But, uh, uh it was not, it was not as bad a movie as I was maybe expecting it to be. Um, although... There is a weird moment in the film where they stop and, like, do an advertisement for, like, a brand of razors. You know how how to guarantee I will not buy your brand of razors? Stop the most transphobic movie I've ever seen dead in its tracks and do an ad read in the middle of that. I've probably talked about this movie longer than I needed to. Like, again... You can watch the trailer for this one, and you'll understand everything that's going to happen in the movie. It's it's bad. Points for the Ben Shapiro. Like, Ben Shapiro was surprisingly not bad in the role they gave him. I was like, eh, this is like kind of a decent line read, actually. 
Matt Walsh plays, like, a pretty major character in the film. Known transphobe Matt Walsh plays a major character. And the whole time I'm like, something's off about this dude. What is going on with this dude? And then at the end of the movie, his character reveals that the whole time he was just the actual person Matt Walsh in disguise. And I'm like, oh... Oh, that's why, that's, that's why this dude's vibes were, like, way off the whole time. It's Matt Walsh in, in a bad wig that doesn't match his beard. He didn't, he, if he at least, if he had at least shaved the beard, I, it would have made sense. But no, no. It's this, I mean, this is a who's who of transphobia in 2023. You get, you got Ben Shapiro, you got Matt Walsh, you got Ted Cruz, you got Candace Owens. I'm surprised there wasn't even, like, a reference to J.K. Rowling. I'm surprised Rowling didn't get a reference. They didn't name drop her at all in this. Real who's who of transphobia nowadays. Anyway, let's move on to a slightly less offensive film. Uh, Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. Uh, I'm not going to spend too long on this one because I, I covered it for Hollow Victories. It is currently the most recent film covered on Hollow Victories. This is like, you know, uh, as of 2023, Winnie the Pooh is in the public domain. So someone's like, hey, we're, let's, let's do a Winnie the Pooh slasher movie. Isn't that so funny? Isn't it so fun? We made, we made the kid's property a slasher movie, guys. Do, do you get it? Do you get that the kids it's a kids movie, but it's a slasher movie? Isn't that so funny? Very mediocre slasher. Very below average slasher. Better than the mean one. Uh, spoilers for that episode of Hollow Victory is better than the mean one, but but still, just no. Don't watch this. Don't bother. I there's there's no reason to watch this. Not even out of it's not even worth it out of curiosity. Uh, just listen, listen to the Hollow Victories episode. If you're curious about this film, watch the Hollow Victories episode. Skip the movie. All right, we're we're skipping way up the list here because that 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 one's that one I said was like a three. Uh, this next one, six out of ten. It's the FNAF movie. Here's the thing: I've I've been bitching about the upcoming Five Nights at Freddy's movie since like I started this channel. That was like. One of the early targets that I would just, like, pick on constantly in, in like, my, my old, old video, like, like pre-Matt's Fun Time weird movie show videos, pre-Matt's Fun Time bad movie show videos, I, w I would make fun of the upcoming Five Nights at Freddy's movie. And honestly, they took so long to come out and changed hands so many times it probably did benefit the movie. I'm sure this is better than the FNAF movie we would have gotten in, like, 2017, 2018. Unless the Banana Splits movie actually was supposed to be the FNAF movie. Because I might like the Banana Splits movie a little better than this. No, I'm, not, I'm not gonna lie. Honestly, this feels... I hate to say it feels disconnected from Five Nights at Freddy's, because no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. But it's definitely more like the internet game theory side of FNAF and not like that first FNAF game, the first Five Nights at Freddy's game before all the lore bullshit where, where it was like really scary. I, 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 I genuinely think... Like, the animatronics from the original Five Nights at Freddy's game are some of the creepiest designs I have ever seen for, like, anything, honestly. They, they make me so uncomfortable. I am so freaked out by those things. And I'm not even scared of animatronics. I, I think animatronics are a weird thing to be scared of. Those guys freaked me out. The animatronics in this movie, they're a little too friendly, a little too soft around the edges. I'm not really scared of the characters in this movie. And they don't really try to make me scared of the, the characters in this movie. They're honestly playing Freddy and his pals is pretty sympathetic. There, There is a moment where it seems like they, they, they're they putting the girl in danger because they're all, like, 
powered by the ghosts of dead kids and they want her to come join them and be a dead kid too. I, it just, it deals way too much with the lore side of things. So I'm sure for like an obsessive Five Nights fan, like this would work, but I don't know. I kind of liked that first Five Nights game. I, I, at least, at least to the extent that it was scary. I do think it was sort of obnoxious to keep playing for too long because at, at some point you're like, like, like the suspense is like, oh God, oh fuck, what are they going to do? What are they going to do? And then once you figure it out that it's just a jump scare every single time, it's just kind of like, okay, I don't really want to keep playing because I know what's going to happen if I lose and I won't enjoy it. <laughs> But but you know it's a it, it's a scary game and I don't I don't think any of the things that work about the original FNAF game have made it into this film. This film is is bogged down by the the decade of lore that came before it. How old is Five Nights at Freddy's? Hold on, I'm looking I'm look, looking this up. Released in 2014. Okay, so a little under a decade. Nine years. Nine years of lore is dragging down this movie. But maybe also elevating it in some ways. I don't know. Like, hard, hard saying what like a like an actually scary FNAF movie would be like. But it ain't this. This is like not even trying to be scary. Also, holy shit. Hollywood... Please, please start paying your lighting department. Please start hiring lighting departments that know what they're fucking doing. All the dark scenes in this movie look like trash. All the dark scenes in like pretty much every movie I've seen for the past four or five years have looked like trash. Get better lighting departments. I mean, there was stuff I liked about The Five Nights, but I did. it was not like a totally terrible experience, but... I mean, I, I like I like that Matthew Lillard is still out there, still getting work. He does pretty good in the in, his, in the role he has in this movie. Yeah, I I I don't know what more I have to say about this one. It's again, like if you're into the lore, if you're really invested in FNAF, you probably will like this movie. I am not at all invested in FNAF, and I was kind of underwhelmed by it. <laughs> Fast X, the new Fast and the Furious movie. We got two X movies this year. We also got Saw X, which I didn't get to. I didn't. I, it's 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 right there. It's sitting right there off screen. I'm gonna drunk tweet it this week. Uh, so I I mean, by the time you're by the time you're watching this, like follow me on Twitter and I'll I'll drunk tweet this like probably Monday or Tuesday next week. But, uh, Fast X, which I, I did drunk tweet, incidentally, since, I, so, you know, I drunk tweeted the entire uh, Fast and the Furious franchise. Only fair that I, I also do that for the tenth one here. It's one of the better ones, I think. Better than nine, for sure. Nine just had way too much going on. This one reels it back a bit from nine. It does still have, there are still, like, too many plates in the air. There are still too many characters in this series. But, like, it's it's less of a problem. In the, it's, it's simpler. It's more truncated in this one. Um, there's, like, three or four specific things that are going on. So it's a, it's a little easier to keep track of. Uh, plus, I just... I love the villain in this. Ooh, Jason Momoa plays the villain in this, and he is so good. He is so good as the villain in this movie. He's he is funny. He is funny as hell in this film because he's he is j playing just like this like flamboyantly gay villain who is like absolutely unhinged the entire film. I, I love Jason Momoa. He is my favorite character of the Fast and the Furious franchise now. I love him so much. Is it a great movie? No. No, not at all. But, like, if you're this deep into the Fast and the Furious franchise, you might as well watch this one. Like, 
like I said, I think it's one of the better. It's it's on the upper end of of Fast and the Furious movies. Uh, it is still dumb, overcomplicated, way too long. Uh, it's, it, and it, 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 spoilers, it ends on a cliffhanger. There's gonna be like a, a part two and I think like a part three to this as well. So I, I don't, I don't, I don't love this movie, but I, it's a Fast and the Furious movie. Like at this, at this point in the franchise, like... I don't know, there's there's no stopping this thing. <laughs> now, some, something I should say is, for, for a while now, s- since before even, like, the ninth Fast and the Furious movie came out, I think it was around the time F- 8 of the Furious came out, I'm like, alright, 10th movie in the Fast and the Furious m- series should be called Fast X, which it was, but I also said it should take place in space. This should be the the Fast and the Furious franchise goes to space movie. And they didn't do that. Now they did go to space at the end of the ninth movie. They they like built a car that could escape the Earth's atmosphere and drove into space. So that's kind of ridiculous, but the whole movie was not set in space. I want a fully, like, like Jason X-style Fast and the Furious in space movie. Get to it, Vin Diesel. Get another, get, getting, getting another soda. Alright, this one is not old. This one I bought today. Um, a Mountain Mountain Dew Purple Thunder. New flavor from Mountain Dew. It's not even grape. It's apparently, like, berry plum is what it says on here. So when I was a kid, I had a Jimmy Neutron birthday party. Why is this not opening? What the fuck? I had a Jimmy Neutron birthday party, and the substitute for purple flurp was grape soda. And I was kind of disappointed by that, because I don't really like grape soda. So, uh... I'm kind of hoping this will give me, like, the flavor, the, the purple flurp flavor that I never got. This better taste like what I think purple flurp tastes like. I didn't taste anything like I was expecting it to. Not bad, but I mean, like... I don't know, it's kind of super generic berry flavor. The Super Mario Bros. movie. Uh, Another film I've been making fun of throughout its production. Granted, that's been a lot more recently. The second they announced it was from Illumination, I'm like, that's a bad sign. And all of the trailers made this look terrible. The trailers made this look bad. I was not... Expecting anything from this movie just based on the trailers. And it was actually pretty decent. It was pretty fun. I enjoyed it. It's it's easily Illumination's best movie. Maybe except for, for Despicable Me. And even then, I think this is better than de- the first Despicable Me. But it's it's not like easily better than Despicable Me. The two are pretty close. It's, it's like Super Mario Bros... Uh, original uh, 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 Despicable Me, and then the, this is like like Sing Sing Two, Despicable Me Two. Most of the rest of their output, actually good movies. But I mean, you know, the Super Mario Bros. movie. It's fun. It's energetic. There are a lot of good action sequences. It's well animated. Uh, Chris Pratt, clearly the weak link as a voice actor, but even then, he wasn't as bad as we thought he was gonna be. He's just, he's just kind of there. He's just kind of a dude. Anya Taylor-Joy, uh, also a weird casting, because it just kind of seems like this could be any woman. This could literally be any woman, and it would not make a difference. <laughs> but it's... Charlie Day, Jack Black, they run away with this thing. They are killer in this movie. 
Uh, even uh, Seth Rogen. Seth Rogen's fun. See, he does a good job as Donkey Kong. He's, he's a decent Donkey Kong. I saw a meme for this movie before it came out where someone was like, Woody Allen as Cranky Kong. And then in the actual movie, Cranky Kong has this very New York Jew accent. And I'm like... Did they get Woody Allen to, to play him? It's not. It's Fred Armisen. But, uh... There was a, mo there was a moment where you could have convinced me it was Woody Allen as Cranky Kong. <laughs> L listen, if, if you have a kid who's really into Mario, if your child loves the Mario games, and, and loves the Mario characters, and wants to know more about the Mario lore... They will probably really enjoy this movie. It is a great movie for children who like Mario. Me, personally, I've seen it twice. I will never watch it again. Probably. I will probably never watch it again. Uh, I, I have seen the original Super Mario Bros. movie like five times, and I will keep watching it. Okay, I am not done with the original Super Mario Bros. movie. I will watch that movie for the rest of my life. This Mario movie... Whatever, man. Like, it's decent. It's, it's objectively the better Mario movie. But I'm never gonna watch it again. I don't care. The Last Voyage of the Demeter. All right, guys. I'm I'm gonna let you in on a on a little secret here. I'm gonna let you in on what I've been cooking up for a while. Uh, my next big like ranking a hundred movies all in one go video is gonna be ranking every single Dracula movie. My God, there are a lot. I, I am through, like, 80 of them, and I am, like, not even three-quarters of the way through. <laughs> I am not even two-thirds of the way through at 80 movies. I have seen 80 Dracula movies, and I, I, I still have so many more to go. I am past the halfway point. I'm actually, like, decently past the halfway point at this point. But I haven't even made it to the two-thirds mark. So as part of that, I watched the recent release, The Last Voyage of the Demeter... Uh, which is actually kind of an interesting concept. It takes a chapter from the book that doesn't get a lot of attention in movies. Most movies completely glaze it over, uh, where the the Demeter takes Count Dracula and, and his belongings from Transylvania to England, but of course it washes up on the shore... All of the men are dead. The captain is tied to uh, the the wheel with a cross in his hand, and and that's usually where most movies leave it. It's like, okay, bye, Demeter. Oh, it washed up on the shore of England, and and we have no idea what happened in that span of time. So this is a movie that focuses on that span of time that gets neglected by so many other Dracula movies, and. It's a pretty generic horror movie, maybe a little above average. Like, uh, I, there was stuff I enjoyed about it. I like the performances. The performances, the characters, they're all good. But, like, uh, it, like it's such a generic horror movie. Like, the way the, the horror movie plays out is so generic. Uh, a lot of the kills are not very good. A lot of the effects are, like, not very good in this film, honestly. And and also, like, I got, the problem is, like, they, they made me like these characters at the beginning, and I'm like, that's great. I know none of them survive. I know, at best, one of these characters is gonna make it out alive. And even then, even then, I'm kind of, like... Like, one character does make it out at the end. The main character makes it out at the end. Because, of course, he does. And even then, I'm like... You should... That, that, does, that shouldn't... You shouldn't do that. That's not how the book goes. That's not how the story... Everyone on the Demeter dies. Come on. So, so you're introducing me to all these, like, endearing characters. And I'm like, that's great. I know none of them are gonna make it. I know none of them make it. I'm sorry. That just... That's, that's gonna make it hard for me to get that invested. And then, 
when their deaths aren't even that good, it's like, what are we doing here? I don't know, not a bad movie, but like, pretty pointless one. I'll go into more detail when the Dracula video comes out, which granted, might not even be out this time next year. Just, just, just complete transparency on that one. Might not even be out by this time next year, but... If you want to know more about Last Voyage of the Demeter, click subscribe and hold out hope. Up next is Suitable Flesh. Ah, this one was a little disappointing, actually. I was, I was kind of hopeful for this one, and it was... I mean, it was fine, but I, I, I wanted more. I wanted more out of this film. So this is, this is based on a, a, a Lovecraft story. It's a Lovecraftian movie that I'm given to understand Stuart Gordon was kind of working on before he passed away. Stuart Gordon, the director of Reanimator, the best Lovecraft adaptation. There is not a better Lovecraft movie than Reanimator. So Stuart Gordon was working on this before he passed away, I think. And then Joe Lynch took over, uh, the director of Mayhem, a great movie, and also the best uh, uh, wrong turn movie, Wrong Turn 2. So, so I had some hope for this being like a really fun, over-the-top gore fest and... It's not. I, I was kind of let down by this one. And I was also, like, a lot of the promotion around this one, they're like, oh, this is like a, a sexy Lovecraft adventure. Not really. Characters have sex in this. There's, there's some, like, body swap antics that tend to, but not always, involve sex. But I don't know that it's really, like, that sexy a movie. I've definitely seen... Lovecraftian horror done sexier. Uh, shout out to Toby Hooper's Life Force. That that's a sexy Lovecraftian film. It's not actually based on a Lovecraft story, but it's it's very Lovecraftian and real sexy. This, I mean, I I appreciate them like tur turning an eye towards like older women in this one. Like, Barbara Crampton's in the film. Barbara Crampton's in her 50s. She's still hot, and the movie acknowledges that. <laughs> but I was, I was really under... It's, it's, not, it's not fun, it's not campy, it's not over the top. There's not really that much violence. Uh, even the, the Lovecraftian elements aren't that interesting. It's, it's, a, it's a guy who keeps... Who's been transferring his soul from person to person for, like, hundreds of years to stay alive. Which, like, okay, that's something. There's an interesting idea there, but, uh... I, I, I don't know that it coalesces into much. And... I don't know, the guy's just kind of a piece of shit. This hour 40 movie could be... a 20-minute episode of the Magnus Archives, and it'd be a better movie... Or it could be a short story from from H.P. Lovecraft, and it would probably be a better story that way. Uh, I just like there's stuff I like about the movie. I'm not like again, this is, we're 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 up in like we're above a five out of ten here. We're at the like these are above average movies. I did not hate this film. There there is quite a bit I enjoyed about the film, but I just wanted so much more. It, it was it was an underwhelming film. It did not meet my expectations. It, it there's like a pretty pretty decent gap between like what I expected out of this movie and what I actually got. I will say like beautifully shot movie it is a great cinematography great cinematography on this one i hate to be that guy this would look amazing if it was shot on film if they had shot this on film that might even have elevated it a little in my opinion it would look so much better shot on film and like i get it i get it this is like a low budget production i even said that joe lynch actually very active on Twitter. If you talk about one of his movies, he will find you. I, I, I tweeted that out and he's like, yeah, we they we asked them if we could fill a shoot it on film and they said no because that costs too much money. And I'm like, no, I get it. I get why this isn't shot on film. 
But oh man, this would look gorgeous if it were shot on film. I don't know. Suitable flesh. It's fine. It's fine. There are worse. There are way worse uh, Lovecraft adaptations. There are worse Lovecraft adaptations from Stuart Gordon. Uh, but I don't know. Noth- nothing about it grabbed me. It held my attention the entire time. I was never bored with this movie, but I was I was always like waiting for something to happen that would like really hook me, and it just it never came. I am joined now by Mitzi, the beautiful and lovely Mitzi, because we're 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 gonna talk about Trolls Band Together, a movie (laughs) I only saw because you wanted to see it. Yes. Do you have anything I should start off saying? I'm sorry, I'm a little out of my element here. (laughs) Well, I I want to start with probably the best Trolls movie, probably the best of the three Trolls movies. Would you agree? The best. Visually, I Definitely. still like two the best, like story wise and music wise. I, I think is the best. I mean, here's here's my confession. Like, uh, the trolls movies. I, I've never been that into the stories in these movies, but uh, I love the aesthetic. These have yeah. great visuals, and and three easily the best visually. I, I mean, down to, like, tiny details. Maybe it was just because I was seeing this one, like, on a theater screen and the other two I've only seen on TV. But, like, the textures. There's so much detail to the oh, textures. Oh, yeah. It reminds me of, like, a Paper Mario game or, like, Kirby's Epic Yarn. Like, those kind of games that have, like, really good texture in them. It's, like, almost, like, craft-like. Which is what it's <laughs> supposed to be. Which is... Also, why it's a lot like I could akin it to something I would, I could relate it to something like um, sorry I have a cold by the way that's also a problem I have a cold I just took a shower I'm not in the place to be in a video but I'm gonna be in it anyway it, it's also like like they when when they animated it they put like the thumbprints on the Legos and stuff like that like in the Lego movie um, but they put so much detail into how like the trolls are supposed to be toys and they're supposed to be dolls. Again, I love doll movies. If you want me to talk about the Barbie movie again, I will, but we already talked about it we did. in a video. I I love toy media. I'm I'm weird about toy media. And I like trolls so much. I actually went to go see it first because of the aesthetic. I literally I saw the trailer for it. I'm like this looks exactly like the thing I want to stare at for an hour and a half. And it gripped me. It gripped my soul very deeply. Um, so I, this 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 one gets into like seventies drug trip kids movie territory. Yeah, it really does. It it feels like it feels like something that would have come out when uh, the original trolls were big. When the, you know naked ass uh, gem belly button fucking looking guys. Have you seen the Super <laughs> Trolls cartoon? Um, I have not. I, I am aware of it. I have not watched it. <laughs> I, I remember watching Trolls with a Z when I was younger. I did watch that. Um, when they tried to make Trolls more of a fashion doll. And it didn't really work out. It didn't really stick. These ones stuck. They're very good. Um, Matt got me this. I got, the, I got you that for our anniversary, Yes. I, I am very happy with this poppy. Um, and, and then I had to hold on to it because it wouldn't fit in your luggage, so I had to bring it out here when I moved. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, like I, I like the story to this one, too, though. I, I like the whole, like, the weird lost sibling thing that they've got going on. Um, I so, like... I love Velvet and Veneer. Though the they're villains, great. The they're awesome. The villains in this movie are great. I love the villains in this. But they have like a <laughs> great design. I love the way they are designed. I love their backstory. Sharpay and Ryan too. <laughs> they, that, they remind the me fucking... of them so much. Do you want to go back to living in the gutters? <laughs> Girl, we grew up in the suburbs. Our parents are dentists. <laughs> it's, it's the best line. <laughs> they're amazing. I love them so much. This one I thought had, like, all the Trolls movies have a lot of heart in them, and that's what I like, I mean, that's that's what I like the most about it. They all have, like, their own different important message about love and connection and friendship and family, and I think that's sweet. Which is a lot of the, like, saccharine shit I'm into. I'm into a lot of, like, the power of friendship and, like, love, and... 
uh, had another one of my favorite tropes. Uh, friendship uh, uh, is, like, deadly and will literally kill you. Is that they all, like, band together and... Um, That's the name of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> no, they all like band together and and you know, just like power through it. Like they, they well, they sing the power note. Yeah, together. Yeah. Now and that's sort of like, you know, that is that is the it, it. It's it's not quite that trope, but what I like about it is like the power of love manifesting into something physical and tangible. That literally, like, solves the problem or kills the villain or something. Like, I, I like that kind of stuff. <laughs> now, now, my understanding of this one is that... I, I thought the other band members were going to be Justin Timberlake's actual other band members. And then all of them are played by, like, actors, comedians. One of them's Eric Andre. Yeah. And then and then at the end, NSYNC shows up. And I'm like... But Justin Timberlake was in the Backstreet Boys, right? I was certain. I was certain Justin Timberlake was a Backstreet Boy. No, no, that they just... I don't know. I don't know what to say about that one because that's also what I was expecting and they didn't do it. So, that's it. I I, I also... We, we talked about this. It feels like this should have been the second movie mm-hmm. and the second movie should have been the third movie. Mm-hmm. No, I I think it works almost. I don't know. There are parts of it that I think would have worked better as a second movie, and then there are there's other stuff where I'm like, no, this this works. This works, I guess. I don't know what to say about. It. I, one one thing for me is like at the beginning they're going to like the Bergen's wedding, right? Mm-hmm. But then uh, uh, Justin Timberlake is like, let's get married, and then they they're all awkward about it, like, oh, hug, huh, but uh, we're not we're not getting married, yeah. and I'm like. But you're dating. Like, you could get married. Like, I don't know. Maybe it just feels too soon for them. I don't know. You don't know their relationship. Maybe they want to take things slow. I don't know. But they clearly want to get married. <laughs> okay, fine. Whatever. Maybe they're both being. Maybe they're both just being weird about it. Here's your drink. Would you like to try some? I actually would. What is the, this? Is the purple Mountain Dew? Yeah, purple flurp. Wait, hold on. I'm sick. Oh, never mind. We share a bed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I have been sleeping in your bed for the past three days. I think I'm fine. I also think you're just congested. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> but it, what what else could be congestion but a cold? You know, allergies. I like Viva. I like her a lot. It's so, it's it's such a weird thing, right? Like to introduce out of nowhere. That they all just have long lost siblings for no I, reason. <laughs> I, I didn't. I don't get it. I, why why does Poppy have a long lost sister in this? Um, why I didn't mean, her father tell her about her long lost sister? Yeah, that is a weird thing. That is a weird thing. That uh, that's sort of brought up, but it's never like addressed. Really? Yeah, there's no like, there's there's no reason. King, there is no reason given in the film King Peppy other does than not, other than he's just like a shitty dad. Yeah, King Peppy does not get confronted about this. They're just like, "Huh, it's weird how we were never told about this." So, um yeah. So I uh I got lost when the all the trolls got separated and we left Bergen. But I also like think that they're like trolls golf society is so cool i don't even care like that's one of the things i love about the second one too is just like learning there's like all these different creative little troll cultures and also now learning that there are so many other creatures like we knew about trolls and bergens but now there's like these fucking balloon animal people (laughs) and that's all i'm gonna call them because they look like they're made out of balloons um, the the Muppet people. Yeah, then there's the Muppet people. Like I like the world building in this one. It's it's kooky. I mean, you don't get to use that phrase a lot. Kooky. It's a kooky movie. <laughs> yeah, uh, I like the aesthetics. Um, story kind of goes where you think it's going. Yeah. I like the the music. The musical cues can be a little much in all of these, but in this in this one, like. Uh, one of the ba- the band member that's like trapped, the brother that's trapped, mm-hmm. starts singing a sad song and he sings like a verse and then it's over. Yeah, no, that is weird to me because in 
you know, in the other two, they would either do, like, a medley or a full song. Um, and there was very rare points where they sang very little of a song, and then it just moves on. This one has a lot of it, where they just sing a little bit of a song, and then it moves on. Like, there's no, there's nothing else to it. And that, I, I think, is weird. I liked, I liked when they were singing Feeling Good as Hell, but they weren't allowed to say hell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Too bad. They should have. Let them say hell. <laughs> Let them say hell in the Trolls movies. The trolls should be allowed to swear. Shrek says ass and damn. Yeah. The trolls should be allowed to swear. They should be allowed to say hell. Poppy should be allowed to say fuck. <laughs> she wouldn't, but she should be allowed. She should be allowed, at the very least. All I'm, right. gonna, I'm gonna go back to laying in bed unless you yeah, need me for something Yeah, that's all I else. needed you for. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye. Oh. I just knocked something over. Oh no. <laughs> I'm trying to, like, back up so that I can get out of the chair. Rinfield. Another another Dracula movie. Oh, I like that one. <laughs> I, like, I won't stay I, to talk about it, but I like that one a lot. Uh, Rinfield has kind of become, like, um... Mm, unbearable weight of massive talent. This year's unbearable weight of massive talent for me. Because it's a movie with, like, Nick Cage in a funny role, and that's kind of... What a lot of the marketing was built around is is Nick Cage in a funny role. And they're both movies that I, I went and saw in theaters, enjoyed them a lot in theaters, and nothing about them has stuck with me. It's just like like by the time I get to the end of the year, I'm like Did I like that movie? I I, I felt like I t- like I came out of the theater like, yeah, that was fun, and I don't know. It, none of it stuck with me. None of it stuck with me. Like the, I, I guess, I guess there are like jokes and stuff that land, but there are also a lot of like really obnoxious lines. Uh, some something people were like calling this movie out for even before it was out was like the the Marvel comics like. Whoa, I can't believe that just happened. Whoa, what is this wacky shit? Oh, I didn't. <laughs> and 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 I get that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It was it was a fun time. It was a fun sit. Again, just like just like almost nothing about it stuck. Nick Cage's Dracula stuck with me. Nick Cage is a good Dracula. He is a good Dracula in this film, in part because of the makeup. The makeup's really good, but like they they this is seems to be set in the same, like, universe as the original Universal Dracula. They show footage, they show, like, reshot footage of the original Dracula with Nick Cage and Nicholas Holt in it. And, and Nick Cage, he kind of looks like Bella Lugosi. Like, he kind of pulls off the, the Bella Lugosi's Dracula look. I don't know what to say. Oh, I wish I could show you guys my phone. I'm filming this with my phone. I got a Nick Cage's Dracula sticker, and I stuck it on the back of my phone so I'd be able to distinguish it. Except then I got the sticker wet, and the protective layer came off, and all. Then, like within a week, uh, within a week, all the ink had faded, and so it's just white now. But it was Nick Cage's Dracula. Yeah, Nick Cage's Dracula was fun. Um, Dracula as a metaphor for like trauma for like for for like a toxic relationship like the the vampire familiar as metaphor for a toxic relationship that's a good idea it's maybe a little on the nose they they get a little on the nose with it but like eh. i don't know like i don't again i don't remember much about this movie not a lot about oh ben schwartz ben i i forgot ben schwartz was in the movie he's pretty funny ben schwartz plays like this this crime boss's shitty ass son aquafina might as well not have been there but she's in the movie i guess uh i didn't hate her but again she might as well not be there i like their dedication to to the original Dracula. A lot of the actual Dracula sequels failed to, to to connect themselves to the original Dracula as much as this one did. So, A for effort. Eh. Eh. I'm just kind of eh on this one. 
I liked it when I saw it, and maybe maybe if I saw it again, I'd be like, oh, okay, here's here's all the all the things I like. Ironically, that Dracula video that's gonna come out like a year from now, probably gonna have a nicer review of this film because I wrote it like right after I saw it. Yeah, I don't know. This one, it 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 it, it, it was an entertaining watch, but not one that has really stuck with me enough to 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 talk confidently about it to recommend it even to like insult it i i it, it's just kind of in one ear out the other no i mean not 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 quite in one ear hangs out for like a month and then out the other and now now that we're at the end of the year i'm like did i like this even dungeons and dragons uh, Honor Among Thieves? Honor Among Thieves. The the fourth movie in the Dungeons and Dragons franchise. You might not realize that. You might think like, oh, there's the 2000s movie and then this one. Maybe you know about Dungeons and Dragons too. But I guarantee you do not know about Dungeons and Dragons 3. A movie I literally had to buy second-hand German version of to watch. This was never available in America. It, like, it premiered on the Sci-Fi Channel and then just disappeared into the ether. But I, I've got it. I've got it on Blu-ray. On a German Blu-ray. Dungeons & Dragons 3. This is the fourth Dungeons & Dragons, and it's... I don't think it's actually supposed to be a part of the original franchise. I think this is, like, a clean reboot. We're just doing a new Dungeons & Dragons movie now. And this was fine, you know, fun little action adventure, like clearly, clearly a little inspired by, uh, like, like the, the modern superhero blockbuster, but it does differentiate itself enough in a few places. You know, it's, it's like a, like a decent little fantasy. It didn't like blow me away or anything but i like the characters there's some fun jokes in there i love bradley cooper has a cameo in this movie and it's fucking hilarious love bradley cooper's cameo in this movie there's like a weird thing where like like chris pine and and uh michelle rodriguez's character are like you know best friends in this movie and there's like a scene early on where someone mistakes them for a married couple and they're like, no, no, not us. We're, it's, we're not married. <laughs> Could you imagine? <laughs> which, which typically is like the very obvious, oh, we're going to be a couple by the end of the movie. And then there's just not a couple by the end of the movie. And in fact, it's implied that Michelle Rodriguez is interested in someone else at the end of the movie. So I don't know why that was in there. <laughs> Maybe they were actually trying to establish that these two don't have romantic feelings for each other. But they did a really bad job of that. Like they, they, they made it seem like there was romantic tension between them. And they were just like not acknowledging it. When in actuality, there is actually no romantic tension between them. I, I will say, as an active D&D player, most accurate part of this movie, character with dark vision announces that they have dark vision the second they enter a dark tunnel. Least accurate part of this movie, someone gets killed with a whip. Whips in, in Dungeons and Dragons are the most disappointing weapon because they're so cool and then it's like, yeah, 1d4. And it's like, why can't I do real damage with... Why can't I do more damage with a whip? A whip should do way more damage than 1d4. Come on. It's, it's, are we, are we doing BDSM here? I could kill someone with a whip. Well, someone trained with a whip could kill you with it. Maybe not me, but like someone who knew what they were doing could kill you with... Indiana Jones could kill you with a whip. Why does it do 1d4 damage? Fuck you, Wizards of the West Coast. Beef beef up the whip. I'm trying to think of other stuff I liked about this movie, and I'm like, oh, well, I like Hugh Grant. Uh, oh, I like this other character. This is a guy they meet, like, halfway through, who, like, helps them out a lot and then, and then disappears. Does... I mean, I guess he adds a little to the movie. He helps them out in, in the, like, the... I, 
the Lost Mines of... It might be the Lost Mines of Phandelin, actually. He, they go to a mine, he's there, he helps them in the mine. What, what do I like about this movie? This character, this character, this character, this character. A lot of good characters in this movie. I, I, I really <laughs> enjoyed the characters. Story's fine. It's whatever. I mean, this, this is like, there, is a, there is an adventure... They go on and they they go on a decent adventure. There's a scene that's like clearly set up around like, hey, look, it's it's all all the iconic D and D villains in one area, right? We we got the gelatinous cube. We got the mimic. We got uh, the the thing that like projects versions of itself. All the iconic enemies crammed into this little maze. This this scene exists to show off all the classic D and D villains. I think there's a beholder in there, which which wouldn't make sense. That's like super dangerous. That's like impossible to deal with. And and you know what? There are dragons in this movie, like at least two dragons. Uh, kind of short on dungeons. I would say they maybe went into like one dungeon, and even then, it was it was not actually a dungeon. It was a mine. It was a cave. I I would say they are short on dungeons in this movie. Also short on Jeremy Irons, but. I mean, like I said, I loved all the characters in this. Like, Jeremy Irons would just be, like, the icing on the cake, you know? Probably easily the best Dungeons & Dragons movie there's ever been. Where this is another jump in quality here, because, like, Dungeons & Dragons, like, Light 7. I enjoyed it well enough. It was good. But now we're hopping up to just, like, a solid 8. Like, there was, there was no middle ground this year. I actually, I, I think 2023 was a pretty good year for movies. Even, like, the corporate schlock was pretty good. You know, I, I expected a lot less out of Dungeons & Dragons, Five Nights at Freddy's, uh, the Mario movie. I expected a lot less out of these films. And you know what? Uh, they delivered, actually. And and I think the best films of the year are are great. I think there's a lot of really good films from 2023, starting with the worst of the best, Nimona. A uh, solid, solid movie. Better fantasy film than Dungeons and Dragons. I'll tell you that much. Um, also a lot gayer than Dungeons and Dragons, thankfully. In case you missed, this was like the last movie Blue Sky was working on. Disney wasn't interested in it, and it eventually ended up going to Netflix, and it's kind of amazing how much better this was, how much better this did than any of the Disney movies that came out this year. Um, I can't say it's better than any of the Disney movies that came out this year. I didn't watch any of the Disney movies that came out this year. I assume it's better than them. I have heard nothing but, like, like the best I've heard is, like, eh, Elemental was, like, pretty good. Wish I have heard zero good things about, and and Elemental even that people seem to be mixed on. People love Nimona. Nimona's doing great. Everyone loves Nimona. Um, is it up for best animated feature? Mm -hmm. I, I I know it was up for like a bunch of Annie awards, um, and like it was it was a big thing that like that the mo the movie Disney rejected got a bunch of Annie award nominations. And none of Disney movies did. All right, yeah, it is. It is best uh, up for best animated feature. That's great, along with uh, Spider Verse and the movie that I was not allowed to watch. I'm so mad I couldn't see the boy in the heron. I'm so mad I couldn't see the boy in the heron. Uh, Nimona is a fun fantasy adventure about like this uh, little shapeshifter girl who I guess is actually like a thousand year old dragon. Um, and she's like, there's this whole city where their whole thing is like, oh, we got to protect ourselves from the big evil dragon that lives out, out, outside the city. And oops, Nimona is the big dragon they're protecting themselves from. And, uh, I, I, and I mean, it's like a, a really solid movie about like, I don't know, personal identity and, and, and people who don't fit in with with the system with normal society i mean i i even in my letterbox review compared it to luca and how it does better what i th 
wanted out of Luke. Like, all the good stuff about Luca is also in Nimona. But also Nimona is, like, a way more interesting movie. A way more interesting, like, character going on a more interesting adventure. Uh, the animation's probably not as good. But even then, like, there's some really big, like, chase sequences in this film that are really well done. Um, I will say, the, the animation is the one place I'm kind of shaky on this. Because it's, it's not even bad. It just, it gives me League of Super Evil vibes. It looks like the show League of Super Evil to me. But, uh, I mean, Nimona, fun movie. Really fun movie. Uh, the highest recommendation from me. I, I loved this film. Uh, uh, I, I really enjoyed it. Please, if you, if you get the chance, I mean, it's on Netflix. Check out Nimona. And, and I mean, that wasn't even, that wasn't even one that was on my radar. That was like, I think Mitzi watched it without me and then was like, come on, come watch Nimona with me. And I'm like, okay. I, I don't, I don't know if they had seen it before they showed it to me or not, but we watched it together and I'm like, well, okay. Yeah, that was really good. I was really into that. Something I cannot say about the animated movie they showed me most recently. <laughs> it's called The Tiger's Apprentice. Not good. Don't recommend it. Nimona, ton of fun. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem. Yeah! So it's kind of funny how dead hype has been for, like, super played out franchises this year. Obvi obviously the writing has been on the wall for superhero movies for a while now. Like, Marvel did Endgame, their big, like, easy jumping off point for, for longtime fans. And then they followed it up with 2020, a year where they didn't release any blockbusters. So, not a surprise that the MCU has really failed to, to in the box office this year. Ditto everything DC is putting out, but that's just because DC has been shit from the very start. From, from the very start of, like, this recent, like, cinematic universe phase. All the best stuff they've put out exists, like, on the fringes of that, right? Like, Joker is outside of it. Shazam is, like, barely connected to it. Uh, even then, I t Shazam 2 came out this year, didn't it? And no one cared. No one cared that Shazam 2 came out. I saw an article that's like, Oh, the DCEU is officially over now that Aquaman 2 is out. And I'm like, there's an Aquaman 2? I, I saw like zero advertising for Aquaman 2. The only one I knew came out was The Flash. And that was only because it was a huge shit show. <laughs> So, yeah, superhero movies have been dying. Indiana Jones 5, I just think it's hilarious how there has been no reaction to it. Because I remember Crystal Skull. I remember the hype going into Crystal Skull and how angry everyone was for years after Crystal Skull. Because they're like, oh, you ruined the, the Indiana Jones franchise. Which, yes and no. I mean, I don't know why you expected a movie coming out like 20 years after the last film to be that good. But, I mean, I was hyped for it. I was looking forward to it. I was disappointed. I was angry. No one had any expectations for Indiana Jones 5. And I don't think anyone went and saw Indiana Jones 5. I, I, I think I've heard like one person say it sucked. And, and everyone else has just kind of ignored it. And unfortunately... Unfortunately, the the uh, complete lack of hype for played out franchises has kind of also extended to Ninja Turtles. I did not hear anyone really talking about Mutant Mayhem. And that's too bad because it's really good. This is like the best Ninja Turtles movie since like 1990. And even then, like... I love the 90s Ninja Turtle movie. I could easily see someone who did not grow up with the Ninja Turtles and is not that invested in the Ninja Turtles watching that movie and being kind of bored by it. I should show it to Michael. Michael has no investment in the Ninja Turtles. He, he, Michael, Michael would probably not like this film. Um, 
not that I think he'd hate it, just like I don't I don't think he would be as into it as I am. Where where mutant mayhem, I think I could show Michael and he'd be like, "Oh, wow, that is yeah, like really good, really well done." It's it's funny, it's really well animated. I I <laughs> love like they've they've kind of gone in like a, a spider-verse direction but at the same time like they've also done just enough to distinguish themselves from spider man spider-verse i love how fugly some of the humans in this look like there are just some like deformed people walking around in the background of this movie it almost looks like like this could be like a toxic crusaders movie <laughs> Just based on how, like, fucked up some of the characters look. It's it's just, like, a fun movie. Uh, it's really well done in a lot of ways. It is also the Ninja Turtles movie where the turtles feel the most like teenagers. Which is a problem for me. Because it really drives home how not a teenager anymore I am. How I'm, like, ten years removed from being a teenager, even. That hurt me a little. I was like, wow, I am out of touch with the youth. Fuck, it's finally happened. But I still enjoyed the movie. <laughs> Ton tons of fun, uh, great character designs, great animation. I love Mondo Gecko in this movie. I love Mondo Gecko so much in this movie. Ooh, the Mondo Gecko X Michelangelo vibes, top notch killer ship right there like like i went into this movie zero investment in in a mikey uh mondo gecko ship came out of the movie these two are fucking love those two i like the villain in this movie i like that the villain has a tie to the ninja turtles and i like that he kind of uses their bond to like manipulate them into helping him a little bit um and he's voiced by Ice Cube. Like, damn, it's good, good casting, good casting there. I, it's, it's the movie where Splinter knows the least. Like, Splinter literally teaches them karate via like YouTube videos. Um, D D Jackie Chan as Splinter kind of feels obvious, but like, I'm glad it finally happened. And I love that even though it's an animated movie, he still got to do an over-choreographed over fight scene using a bunch of props. Like, it, they, they just put a Jackie Chan fight scene in this animated film, and I love that. Yeah, Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem. It's great. It's the best Ninja Turtles movie since the best theatrical one. I haven't seen Rise of TMNT. I heard that one was pretty good. But this is the best theatrical Ninja Turtles film since 1990. Alexander Payne's The Holdovers. So I'm going to tell you uh, exactly the thing everyone else has said about this movie. Super predictable story. The story is like as predictable as you could possibly get. And it is elevated only by the fact that the characters are really well acted and really well written. The characters make this movie. Like, like it's such a cliche plot, but at the same time, it's like, you know what? This is the best version of that story I have ever seen. I Paul Giamatti is great. Uh, the lady, she's, she's up for Best Supporting Actress, and I... I I really hope she gets it, actually. Divine Joy Randolph. Uh, up for Best Supporting Actress. She deserves it. She did great. Um, and the the kid, who's never acted before, just, like, showed up to the audition for this and got the role. He does great! He does great! I don't know, just a really funny movie with really compelling characters. I know the plot's cliche. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I still really enjoy... Like, that is that is the one thing bringing this film down, is that, like, yeah, this story goes exactly where you think it is going. Also, I would say... There are characters who are a little too well-established in the front end of the movie, who don't really do anything later. Meanwhile, there's this janitor character who's, like, kind of important later in the film, who doesn't get that much of an introduction... So I would say, like, maybe a little more time for the janitor in the front half and a little less time for the characters who just don't show up again. 
but uh other than that that that's like those are like my two nitpicks the the janitor needed to be better established as compared to like some of the other characters who sh- should have been less established and uh very very cliche plot otherwise beautiful movie wonderfully made great performances um great characters um one of the best christmas movies i've ever seen probably in my like top 10 christmas movies and and i love that an adult drama from someone like alexander payne like crushed it at the box office this opened like thanksgiving weekend against the new disney movie and trolls band together and it it was number one that weekend it did really well at the box office that gives me some hope. The fact that this movie did so well gives me some hope that we, we could see, like, a return of those, like, mid-budget adult dramas that we used to get so much of in, like, the 70s. Like, clearly this is pulling from a very 70s aesthetic. And it's it's a type the type of film we would get a lot of in the 70s. And you just don't see anymore. I don't know, hopefully the success of this movie leads to more movies like this. I I would very much like that. I would very much like to see more movies that are like the shit they were making in the 70s. Uh, get on it, Hollywood. John Wick Chapter 4. It's a John Wick movie. Like, I, I said this when the third one came out. I said, the best thing I can say about John Wick Chapter 3 is... It's a John Wick movie. Still true of the fourth one. Still interesting. Still finding new innovative things to do in fights. Donnie Yin shows up as like a blind assassin. And there's this great scene where he sticks a bunch of like magnetic uh, like doorbell sensors everywhere. And uses that to figure out where people are and beat the shit out of them. Like, it's that's just like an amazing idea for a fight scene. They keep coming up with good ideas for fight scenes. Ah, uh, there's a guy with, like, a dog he uses to kill people. And I'm like, wouldn't it be so fucking... It would be so hilarious, so deeply ironic if John Wick got killed by a dog. That would be amazing. Obviously, I don't want that to happen. That would be a ridiculous way to end this. But, like, what if John Wick got killed by a dog? How ironic would that be? I will say, I I probably like it less than the other three, and it is purely out of John Wick fatigue. It's like, okay, yeah, you did a good job, again, for the fourth time. Nothing about this makes it stand above the other three, or below the other three, really, but, like, I don't know. You, you, you've done it four times already. You can only... I'm, I'm good. I'm good. This is the last John Wick film I need. And... Spoilers for John Wick Chapter 4? Minor. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it vague. They do kind of make the ending seem like, oh yeah, this could be the end of the John Wick franchise. Except they've already announced all of these other wild ass spinoffs, and and there are talks to have like a John Wick Chapter Five. And I'm like, how? How are you going to continue the series after this? I'm good. I don't need any more John Wick movies. That was perfect. This is one through four, perfect quadrilogy. Love it. I also, I was a little disappointed with the direction this one went, because I I felt like Chapter 3 was setting up, like, all right, now John Wick and and Lawrence Fishburne are teaming up, and and they're going to, like, take down the system. They're going to, like, start a revolution. Everyone's going to, like, be killing the the bad guys in this way. The, the, like, mob bosses, the high-up people in the mob. And it's, it's like, all hell breaking loose. They're declaring war on these guys. And instead, it very quickly becomes John Wick has to kill this one specific dude so that he specifically can be free of the system. And I'm like, that's not... 
that's not what you pitched to me at the end of John Wick 3. I I wanted more than that. But I mean, yeah, that's the setup. There's this one specific dude. It's Bill Skarsgård. Bill Skarsgård? One of the Skarsgårds. I don't remember which one. Hold on. It was Bill Skarsgård. I was right. <laughs> um, Bill Skarsgård does a great job. I really like the character. He's such an obnoxious little prick. Oh, you're so ready to see this guy die. And, and <laughs> I love John Wick just killing his way through anyone to, to kill Bill Skarsgård. But... I don't know, I, I kind of want the movie that I felt like Chapter 3 was setting up. Where they're just gonna, they're gonna kill their way to the highest ranks of the mob, and they're gonna wipe out the mob for good. But, uh, I mean, what we got? Solid movie. Great movie. Can't say it's any better or worse than the other John Wick movies, but I like the other John Wick movies. It is the fourth John Wick movie. Shrek's Sour Swamp Soda. Makes me wish I was actually talking about Shrek 2 Retold. I did see... Sh I saw an early cut of Shrek 2 Retold uh, this year. But the film is not finished. I'm considering it a 2024 film. We will talk about Shrek 2 Retold next year. Um, even though I did technically see it in 2023. <laughs> I don't think this is good anymore. I think these bottled sodas are losing their flavoring <laughs> just sitting up there. Because they, they all kind of have this same distinct flavor to them. That like, like... Like the actual flavor feels muted. And then there's like this... I don't know. Almost watered down flavor to them. I think they're going bad just sitting over there. I've had this one a while. I've had this one a while. Okay, so uh, I just talked about a movie that I've decided I am putting higher than this one. Uh, so now we're going to talk about this one. It's the one I'm wearing right on my shirt. Hundreds of beavers. I was very fortunate that this came uh, to uh, the Oriental in Milwaukee. That's not a slur. It's the name of the theater. Uh, I was I was very lucky that this this came to a theater near me and I got to see it. Because right now, right now they're kind of like taking it across the country like, old-school drive-in movie style. I don't know when it's gonna be out on digital. I, I saw the director afterwards, and I wanted to ask him when it was going to be out, like, physically or digitally, but he, he was talking with someone else. I didn't get the chance to. Apparently, they're from Wisconsin, though, so that's nice. Uh, I, I, did, I did get to see this one before most people have, uh, and it's, it's amazing. It's hilarious. It's... This this is a movie that just does, like, every cartoon gag that you can think of uh, in live action. It's it's not a cartoon. It's all done in live action. And there, there are other movies that, like, do cartoon gags in, in live action. But they tend to limit themselves to the ones that will actually look good in live action. Some of this movie looks really awkward. There are some really awkward looking moments in this film. And you know what? I don't care. I, I'm just, like, I am blown away that they put forth the effort to do this. And and on top of that, like, things get presented and you're like, Oh, okay, what a silly gag. But then, like, as the movie goes on, they all start to, like, build on each other. He starts to use the cartoon gags to his advantage. He's starting to, like figure out how the cartoon physics of this world work and use it to his advantage and so that's a lot of fun it definitely has a lot of like video game vibes clearly it was very inspired by video games as much as it was like cartoons and silent movies and i mean even even in the q a the director was talking about like the comparison between silent film and video games and honestly i i kind of see it like in a in a video game especially like old video games you gotta get a lot of information across to the audience it, with like no word with very little words at least you, you gotta like convey information to the audience without dialogue and so in in that sense yeah very similar to to silent film i i see the connection there just just baffling that 
they that anyone even filmed this. Uh, the star of the film, whose name I am blanking on, but he he was there and he seemed like a, a really nice, fun person. But uh, he he throws himself into all of these physical gags with like the full force of of like Buster Keaton or Jackie Chan. Like he is just throwing himself at this shit. He's getting like here's the thing. Like a lot of the film is fake. You the, a lot of the film has been like made up in editing and that's that's kind of why i was saying it looks awkward sometimes but because so much of it is fake the parts that are real are very obviously real so you can so when when he like runs at something and just like slams into a fence post or something like there, there's a there is a scene where he like runs at a fence and just like flips over it like you know he actually did that it's very obvious that that was something he actually did I am I am very impressed with this movie. I really enjoyed this film. I actually wrote about it for uh, the first issue of my upcoming uh, film zine, Keep Movies Weird. So if you want my extended thoughts, uh, check out Keep Movies Weird when it comes out. I just really loved Hundreds of Beavers. It was a great time. Uh, as soon as soon as you get the opportunity to watch this movie, watch it. Watch it. May, December, the new Todd Haynes movie. I'm a big Todd Haynes fan. Granted, I prefer early Todd Haynes. Early Todd Haynes does, like, weird experimental stuff I like. Where at a point he just became like, okay, here's like a fucked up drama. And, uh, here's a fucked up drama. May, December. <laughs> so, this is about uh, a woman who, like, back in the 90s got caught having sex with an 8th grader, um, and then when she got out of prison, she married the 8th grader, and now they've been living together for, like, 25 years. And, and someone wants to make a movie about them, and, uh, Natalie Portman is playing her in a movie, so she comes out to the house and is doing all this research into, uh, uh this woman and, and her husband, uh, and it, it's just sort of like a really bleak, really disgusting portrait of like a, a, a not good at all relationship. A relationship that has been rotten from the very start and has only festered since then. <laughs> this one's bleak. This one's kind of a dark movie. Um, I enjoyed it. I had a good time with it. Good time might be an exaggeration. Well, I, I had a good time watching it. I don't know that it's like a, like a f feel good fun time movie, but uh, it's 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 a good movie. It's a good movie. I like all of the actors are on point here. All of the performances in this movie are are like on point. The ideas and themes at play are really compelling, really poignant, and it's it is pretty subtle about them. Like it it doesn't it doesn't like shove it in your face. It it's it it's a nuanced look, but it's it's a pretty negative nuanced look. Like like any normal person is going to come away from this like, wow, that's kind of fucked up. But it is nuanced about it. It is trying to show all the sides here. It is trying to show everything at play here. Just, you know, the situation is bad. The situation is pretty transparently bad. And and, and I mean, what what really helps this this story is just Natalie Portman's presence and how much she like like she, she is the one pulling at the thread that makes this whole thing fall apart. And I, that I love. Um, honestly. <laughs> ew, this is... This is like a, a comparison I might get some shit for making. I This is like a little closer to like what I wanted out of Caché. I, I generally like Mikhail Hanukkah. Hanukkah, however you say it. But Caché I was just not into. And I think what I wanted was more something like this. 
right? Like, just Natalie Portman being there, observing them, causes the whole facade to fall apart. Obviously, big differences between this and Caché, but still, it's it's that, like, act of being observed and, and that stirring you to... to self-incriminate i guess to i mean here's the thing like it's not even obvious that that things are falling apart that's one of the things it does really well is like it's not super obvious on the sur- like like everyone's maintaining a surface level uh, amount of fa- everyone's saving face on the surface but it's clear some shit's going on underneath very harrowing movie, very interesting, interesting for sure. Um, well acted, well presented. I'm, I'm like, I'm talking about it and I'm kind of like, man, maybe I liked this movie more than I thought I did. And I still have it like pretty close to the top of the list here. Uh, maybe I liked this more than I thought I did. Maybe it deserves to be over my number 10 spot because my number 10 spot's kind of goofy, ridiculous. I don't know. Oh, there's there's one bad thing I can say about it. Over a minute of opening logos. I am so sick of seeing, like, a minute 20 of opening logos before the fucking movie starts. Knock that shit off, Hollywood. Because I know you're all listening to me. Yeah, I don't know. I might... (laughs) I might raise May, December. Because I'm sitting here thinking about it and I'm like... Nah, you know what? That was better than Hundreds of Beavers. So, uh... Plot twist. I recorded this before I talked about Hundreds of Beavers. I initially had Hundreds of Beavers ranked higher, but... Now that I'm thinking about it... No, May December was like... Like, I have no complaints about this movie. Other than the the opening logos thing, which is like... That's not even... That's, that's not actually a part of the movie. That's just something that pisses me off. It's like a pet peeve of mine that 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 opening logos have gotten so long nowadays. Yeah, I'm I'm raising I'm May December. You have made it to the top ten. Congratulations. I, I did not have you here initially, but you've made it to the top ten. Bo is afraid. The new Ari Aster movie. Uh, director of Midsommar and Hereditary. And I guess of those three, it is probably my least favorite. But I still really enjoyed it. Honestly. It kind of feels like a Yorgos Lanthimos movie. Like, if <laughs> if you had shown me this and Poor Things and were like, can you guess which of these movies is the Yorgos Lanthimos movie? I just said Bo is Afraid. I just said Bo is Afraid is the, the Yorgos Lanthimos movie. It feels like a Lanthimos movie. Um, just, just, like, kind of the, the, the absurdity. There's a lot of, like, absurd stuff going on in this movie. But also, like... The negative, like, like it's negative absurdity, right? It's like bad things, like the most exaggeratively bad thing that could possibly happen to this character keeps happening to this character. It's it's a really like raw, evocative portrayal of like what it's like to have anxiety, what it's like to live with anxiety. It's it's a look inside the mind of of a like debilitatingly anxious man and i like that it's a rough place to spend three hours like genuinely this of of the three three hour movies on this list three plus hour movies on this list all of which i sat through in the last like two weeks mind you of the three three hour movies this is the one that I'm like, okay, the length is a problem. The length is a fucking problem with this movie because it's it's so rough. It's so aggressive and like, it's just an unpleasant place to be for three hours. Don't watch this movie if you have like bad anxiety. If you have bad anxiety, avoid Bo is Afraid. This will trigger your anxiety hard. But... I mean, I suppose, I suppose to some degree, it is accurate, right? Like, like, 
a person with anxiety, they they can't stop. You know, <laughs> like I'm I'm bitching about three hours of this shit. These people live this way twenty four seven. You know, me me the rakish imp with no real problems. Me me who has no mental illness. Me who who feels super out of touch with my own generation because I have never once suffered from depression. Uh, to me, this is too much. Uh, I I like being happy. I like having a happy time. And this movie is not a happy time. Granted, I like movies that are not a happy time. I enjoy a good bad vibes movie, and this is. This is some, like, quality bad vibes. One of the all-time feel-bad movies. And I mean, like, like, I joke about having no, like, mental issues, but, like, I saw, like, my own mother in this film. I This is a movie about a man who, who, who... Has a lot of issues, and a lot of issues that stem from his his overbearing, terrible mother. And I'm like, uh-huh, yep, yep, been, uh, been there, been there, my man. I, I feel you completely. I, I got off luckier than you. I don't have, like, the deep, deep anxiety that you have. But I definitely, I have definitely had issues because of, because of my awful mother. I, I have emotional scars left over from my mother, too. So I, I, I really felt that in this movie. It gets weird near the ending. I mean, it's kind of weird the whole movie. But it gets, like, especially weird near the ending. Uh, and I kind of dug it. I kind of dug the way I like. I, I I really like how this movie ends. Actually, great makeup. The makeup in this movie is really well done. I like the kid they got to play young Joaquin Phoenix. He he looks like young Joaquin Phoenix. Um, some interesting appearances in this movie. Uh, Bill Hader has like two lines in the movie. He has an extremely minor role in this film, but I'm like, oh. Bill Hader! <laughs> um, Richard Kind shows up. Always great to see Richard Kind. Nathan Lane is in this movie as, like, a, a, a pretty major character throughout most of, like... Like, from the half-hour mark to, like, the hour-and-a-half mark, pretty major character. That's that's what feels Yorgos Lanthimos to me about this film. Not only Not just the bad vibes, but also that, like... Okay, we're here, and we're gonna spend a while here. Okay, the character has moved on to here, and now we're gonna spend a little while here. And granted, that also happens in Poor Things. It's just, I don't know, less Lanthimos than it is in this movie. You know, because he, he gets hit by a car, and he spends time with, like, the people who hit him with their car. But then, inevitably, they get upset with him, and he has to run off. And then, suddenly, he's living in the woods with these people. And then, finally, he, like, escapes that and goes and, like, sees his mother. The thing he's been trying to do the whole movie. And, uh, yeah, I mean... Good movie. Probably my least favorite Ari Aster movie. I probably do like uh, Midsommar and Hereditary better than this. But those are, those are like two great movies. And this is a third great movie. So yeah, I, I, I will keep going to see everything Ari Aster puts out. I, I am... I, good work. Good work, man. American Fiction is a movie I only watched because it is nominated for an Oscar, and I was actually surprised by how much I liked it. Also ridiculous that this is up for an Oscar. It is clear, like, it it calls out the Oscars by name at one point, and, and it still somehow got Oscar noms. Like, the Academy. Aca uh, guys, they're making fun of you. This is about you. You are the one being made fun of me. And like, like, I don't know. You, you, you take a look at me. You know where I'm coming from. Uh, I'm not going to act like this movie is not also making fun of me sometimes. But it's definitely, it's definitely a little more vitriol pointed at something like the Academy than, than like me and what I do. So g generally my rule of thumb for best picture nominees is 
I will give them five minutes for every half hour of film. So if the, the movie's two hours long, I will watch 20 minutes. And if I am not interested in continuing the film after 20 minutes, I will stop watching the movie. That At least for, like, the ones I don't actually care about. Inevitably, there are nominees that I, I want to see anyways. Uh, this year we had, like, Oppenheimer, Killers of the Flower Moon. I did want to watch those. Uh, American Fiction was one of the ones where I'm like, I uh, haven't really heard about it. Uh, you got 20 minutes. And it won me over in those 20 minutes, which is not something I can say for Zone of Interest. Zone of Interest has the, the most boring introduction ever. I have seen it in so many fucking other movies. I am so sick of seeing movies that open the way Zone of Interest opens. I like the concept of Zone of Interest. I like the idea behind Zone of Interest. But, oh my god, it is like the most boring, bland, Oscar Beatty style I have ever seen. It is... I could not stand the presentation of that film. It is a boring Oscar Bait movie. And I, I say that based on the presentation alone. Like, no comment on... on the content of the film. I turned it off after 25 minutes. Past Lives, I watched like 30 minutes of actually, and like, I was kind of interested in seeing where that one was going, but I'm also like, I'm gonna sit through to the end of this film and give it like a 6 out of 10. And, and I've got so many other movies I want to get watched before the Oscars. I still have not even looked at Anatomy of a Fall. I am filming, I, I, I've got like a few days before the Oscars. I'm hoping to get Anatomy of the Fall in of of a fall in before the Oscars, but it's just like I don't I don't I don't have that much time. I am not sitting through all of past lives just to give it a six out of ten. Like it seems cute, it seems fine. Not worth it. Not worth it when I don't have that much time to, to watch Oscar movies. Uh American fiction. I'll make time for American fiction because my god. This movie is funny. This movie is f funny as hell. I got more laughs out of the first 15 minutes of this than I will in the entire three-hour Oscar broadcast. You know, this movie is funny. And and I think it, it has something interesting to say. It's got a very interesting, unique point of view on things. Uh, something you don't hear a lot in a lot of movies. It is not subtle. It is not a subtle movie by any means, but I don't like subtle movies. I'm a big fan of a complete lack of subtlety. And honestly, when you're dealing with, with things like this, sometimes sometimes it is best to just like be really blunt with it, you know? I, I feel like I feel like there are plenty of other movies about the black experience that are very and not just not just the black experience but like outsider experience that are very blunt and it's like yeah you kind of have to be blunt about this stuff or people will ignore you people will ignore the thing you said so like okay yeah sure be blunt about it i'm fine with how blunt this movie is and and that's like Maybe my biggest critique of the film is just it's it's not subtle, not subtle at all. Um, also, also I think it's like just a tad bloated. There's just a little too much going on in this movie. You know, like there's a lot of stuff going on with his family, and it's like we don't need all of this to be going on. Like just as an example, like his sister kind of a major character early on in the film. She dies at the 20 minute mark. And that, like, doesn't affect the plot at all. Like, like it barely comes up again that she died. I don't know, just have her die before the movie starts, and then start the movie with him coming out here for the funeral, right? Like, like there's no reason to bring him out to see his family, then kill off his sister... It's just, there's too much going on. They got too much going on in this film. They needed to trim it down some. And also, it's, like, not subtle at all. But I'm kind of okay with it not being subtle at all. I really enjoyed this one. It's funny. It's poignant. It's very meta. There's, like, the... I, I, I definitely compared it to, like, adaptation. Especially the ending. The ending is, like... 
Adaptation did it better, let me be clear. Adaptation is a lot more subtle about it than this film is, but... I don't know, if, if Adaptation is my favorite movie, if I'm comparing your film to Adaptation, must be a pretty good movie. Killers of the Flower Moon. Scorsese still got it! How does Scorsese still got it? He should have made, like, three terrible movies in a row and then retired, like, a decade ago. That's how all, uh, all the other directors go out. Meanwhile, Martin Scorsese is still out here making Oscar-worthy movies. <laughs> I, I really enjoyed Killers of the Flower Moon. I, it's, it's, it's Scorsese's signature style, and it even, it even hits that theme that he loves in, like, a lot of his later movies. Like, pretty, most, most of the movies he's made since, like, Goodfellas have this, like, underlying theme of, like, the corrupting power of money. But this gets so much more focused with it. It specifically focuses on the way we treat minorities in this country because of the corrupting influence of money. So it's, it's, it's even a little more specific than he usually gets with that message. Yeah, it's just a beautiful movie. It's, it's a beautifully crafted movie. I, I, I think Leonardo DiCaprio, like, he's fine, but he's clearly, like, the weak link in terms of performances in this one. He definitely does some weird things in the movie. There's a point where he's, like, I think he's, he, he's ingested some sort of, like, morphine or something to, like... The, that's like making him drowsy and the whole scene after that he's sitting there like like trying to make his face as long as he can like and it it, it looks kind of weird kind of awkward doesn't really work but i mean he's fine i don't i don't hate him i would like maybe this performance could have been better but whatever i i will say like the the plot of this movie seems like it takes place over like many years like like maybe even a decade plus and the characters look exactly the same the entire movie like there is no attempt to make them look younger or older at any point in the film which that's that's another problem also three and a half hours it's a three and a half hour movie and i don't mind i think it uses all three and a half hours entertainingly could it have been shorter yes yes it could very much have been shorter this very easily could have been a shorter movie or it could have been i don't know like a mini series where it is broken up into like four 40 minute chunks does that add up i don't know how long that would be if we broke it up into 40 minute chunks but you know break it up into like 40 45 minute chunks put it on a streaming service. Like, this doesn't need to be a movie. You don't need to make a three and a half hour movie. You could just make a mini series. And it'd be a little more palatable than this. But it's, you know, I think those are minor gripes to have with the movie. Overall, I have zero problems with this movie. It's, it's great. I love De Niro in this film. Uh, I love Lily Gladstone in this film. Uh, Scorsese's directing, Scorsese's writing, it's as good as it ever was. I, I, I love and respect the hell out of this movie. It is a great movie. Worth sitting through all three and a half hours. That's the biggest praise I could give. It's a three and a half hour movie, worth sitting through all of it. Speaking of three hours, Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer's one that much like how you could have made Killers of the Flower Moon like a miniseries, it really does feel like you can like stop this movie at the hour mark and then again at the two hour mark and like take a break. Both of those, both both hour markers, that's like something big happens right before the hour mark and right before the two hour mark. So yeah, if you want to just pretend this is three hour long episodes of something totally works so a problem i have with a lot of biopics is like okay it was good but the best part of it is just the story and i could have gotten that from like a documentary or a written biography or even just like skimming this person's wikipedia page 
Like, I need, I need something more to justify presenting it in this form in this movie. To date my, my example of, like, a, 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 a biopic that does it right is Nicholas Winding Refn's Bronson. Great biopic about, like, Britain's most dangerous prisoner. That, that like, builds on the idea, makes, makes it a movie, makes it feel like there's a reason for it to be a movie. But I think now my go-to example is gonna be Oppenheimer. Because, for one thing, it's much more popular than Bronson. But, like, this is how you adapt a person's life into a movie. This is a film that justifies itself as a movie. In part because it does a lot of wild, like... I hate to say experimental because it's been done so much, but very, like, surrealist editing in there. But also, like, it, it has a very specific story it wants to tell it has a very specific angle it wants to look at uh, uh j robert oppenheimer's life from it's 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 viewing oppenheimer as a political figure like him building the bomb is in there because that's very important to his story it's 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 how he navigated politics how he was used politically how his politics affected th the things he did why he did and didn't work on certain projects and and how he was treated within the political system because of it and and even more than that i think there's like an angle of of looking at how but i think I, it's something that really stuck with me something that really stuck with me from this film is is uh albert einstein's speech at the end where he's he's talking about like they're they're gonna torment you. They're gonna tear you down. And when 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 they're done making you suffer, they'll build you back up. They'll give you awards. They'll pat you on the back. But it won't be for you. It'll be for them. And I think it's it's such an interesting exploration of like this person has gotten too big, too powerful. We gotta tear them down. And, and once we've tear, torn them down, once we've, like, put them in their place and made sure they knew, know, know what their place is, then we'll come back and start praising them again. Then we will accept them again. And, and I mean, I, like, there's so many, so many examples I can think of like that. Oppenheimer might be, like, the biggest, most important one, because, you know, he, he built the atom bomb... And then got treated very poorly uh, because he, he was trying to use the fact that he was the father of the atom bomb to, like, further his political ends. And they're like, all right, we got to cut this guy down to size. And then, you know, years later, uh, it's cool to like Oppenheimer again because we, we've torn him down enough. He knows his place. He's not going to do it again. Now it's cool to like him. I don't know. There's just... There's a lot to talk about with Oppenheimer. I mean, it's a three-hour movie. Of course, there's a lot. To, but I mean, there's so many other things I could talk about with this movie. Josh Peck is in there. People made a big deal about Josh Peck being in this movie. He gets like two lines. He does. He is the one who pushes the button to detonate the, the first nuclear bomb at Trinity. Um, but otherwise, he does nothing important. A lot of a lot of faces in this movie. I don't know. I had a I, I, I really liked this one. It was really well done. Uh, I honestly I think this is my front runner for best picture right now. Obviously, I, I have five movies I've ranked higher for it. Two of them, three of them, aren't even up for best picture. But uh, yeah, I think Oppenheimer is my front runner for for. But it seems like the thing the Oscars would pick. And, uh, I think it would be a solid pick, actually. I would be happy with that choice. The only other movie I think it could be is Killers of the Flower Moon. I think Killers of the Flower Moon is, like, the only other movie that stands a chance at Best Picture. Maybe Holdovers. Holdovers is, like, the dark horse. And, and Barbie is, like, like, the pink horse. Like, they, like there's no chance for Barbie. But also, it wouldn't be, like, unthinkable for Barbie to win. I just don't think it will. 
It's too fun. It's too fun for the... Then again, I said everything everywhere all at once is too fun for the Oscars, and it won. I was wrong about that one. So, maybe Barbie has a chance, but I, I think it's going to be Oppenheimer. If it's not Oppenheimer, it's going to be Killers of the Flower Moon. Or maybe it's going to be the hold. Like, tiny, small, tiny chances of the holdovers. Probably not, though. Probably Oppenheimer or Killers of the Flower Moon. Asteroid City, we sell asteroids. And that's all. Uh, Asteroid City, the new Wes Anderson movie. I disagree with anyone who says Wes Anderson doesn't still have it. Asteroid City was good. Uh, it's... Uh, French Dispatch, I think, was one of his best. French Dispatch is, like, probably top three Wes Anderson movies for me. Asteroid City, I would say, is a little lower down. I am giving it a 9 out of 10, but... Oh, and I think... I think Wes Anderson is a director who has made more 9 out of 10 films than any other director ever. And maybe that's why people are getting frustrated with him is like cuz cuz he does have Grand Budapest Hotel which i think is a 10 out of 10 and then all of his other movies it's like Wes you are so close to making another perfect movie and you never do it you never make that next perfect movie you just get so close every time that's that to me i think is why people are getting upset i don't know though maybe people i, I maybe it's fatigue i don't have the fatigue I love Wes Anderson. I love all of his movies still. I feel like his in his movies are still interesting and varied. Like this one, this one has sci-fi elements. Wes Anderson hasn't done sci-fi before. Come on, he's I, I I love his movies. Even even some of the people who who reviewed Asteroid City well were like, oh, it's good, but it's like not one of a Wes Anderson's best. I, I still think it is. I still think it's a solid Wes Anderson movie. It's probably his weakest 9 out of 10 film, but it's still a 9 out of 10 film. Like, most directors never get that. Just a ton of fun. The, the, the great characters, great performances. Really my only big critique... Honestly, my only critique. My one and only critique with this film is they have this weird framing device where it's all supposed to be a play, and sometimes they will cut to outside the play, but, like, barely? There's, like, three or four scenes set outside the play, and I honestly wish they had developed that more. I wish there was more going on outside the play they 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 don't utilize that Wes Wes Anderson doesn't utilize the 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 out of world stuff enough in this movie still though I I like you can't cut that you can't you can't cut those scenes they're very but I think the most important scene of the film is uh uh Jason Schwartzman I guess storming off in, in, like, the middle of the play and, and like, arguing about it with the director and then, and then meeting Margot Robbie, who was supposed to, like, play his kid's parents in the play, but then that scene got cut, so she's not in the play anymore. That's, like, the most important scene of the whole movie to me, as you can't cut that. So I just wish they had done more with it, right? Like, there's a scene where they, they try to convince, uh... Uh, Scarlett Johansson's character to come back and be in the play and like I don't know why that's there it, it doesn't add a whole lot meanwhile the the scene where uh, Jason Schwartzman and the writer of the play Edward Norton uh, meet great scene very important I think yeah I don't know I, I, I enjoyed Asteroid City other people seem not to but I I enjoyed Asteroid City it's Wes, Wes Anderson haters unsubscribe. Oh god, I gotta talk fast, I'm losing the light. Infinity Pool from Brandon Cronenberg, son of David Cronenberg, who made Possessor, a movie I really liked. I like Infinity Pool way more. I love Infinity Pool. This movie is gross and fucked up, uh, and I am a person who loves gross and fucked up shit. It's also like a smart, poignant 
film has something to say out even even outside like the gross stuff I, I i enjoy it i on letterboxd i called this movie a serbian film if it was good now now obviously this has like a sci-fi slant that a serbian film does not and also a serbian film gets into like a lot of like pretty unsavory things plug to my oh which side is it on which side is it on plug to my serbian film video it's right here in the corner i know exactly which corner it is i think it's this one i'm i'm gonna take a bet that it's this one if I got the right corner, you gotta go watch the Serbian film video. If I got it wrong, you don't have to. Obviously, a Serbian film gets into, like, some really unsavory stuff that this one doesn't really touch on. But I think, at the core, both movies... I mean, both movies are pretty gross and fucked up. Both movies are about, like, you know, I, I, I guess American debauchery uh, invading foreign countries. Like, like the brutality inflicted upon third world countries by by america and americans reveals with like pulling bags off people's heads like there are in in a serbian film and and i mean there's even that angle of like getting into something that you're not really prepared to get into and realizing very quickly like ooh maybe i don't want to be a part of this and, and just getting dragged further and further into it and it, it being harder and harder to get out of as time goes on. I will say, it's a lot kinkier than than uh, a Serbian film. A Serbian film is like, I want to cut off my dick and never think about sex again. Infinity Pool I could kind of get off to at, at, at points. I don't know, I, th I, th I think I've covered it. It's... It's... <laughs> I feel like it hits a lot of the the political beats that a Serbian film is trying to get at in a way that is much more interesting, entertaining, watchable, far less disgusting, while still being pretty disgusting, uh, way than a Serbian film does. Um, Infinity Pool. It's great. I recommend it. Here we go. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Great movie. Moving on, we don't need to. It's, it's fucking Spider first, man. We did across the spy. We we had a a a, a podcast for uh, for across the Spider Verse, right? We did. We did that with Chris and Olivia on their channel. It did come out. Yes. Because I also recorded a podcast on the Super Mario movie that just like disappeared into the ether, but the Spider Verse one came out. Yeah, I've already talked about this one. Like, you you don't need to hear me talk about link Across the, the Spider-Verse. Link, link, link to the video. It's Across the Spider-Verse. Come on. Here's another one I probably don't need to dwell on. Barbie. Great movie. Already recorded a video on it. Um, although I am... I am prepared to go back on something I said in that video. I I, I, I kind of talked about like how how like the the way they overcome the patriarchy in Barbie World didn't didn't actually make a lot of sense to me. With some consideration, I I've kind of taken this movie as like a you know, like a, like a the, the fantasies of a woman, right? You start out young and hopeful, and you've got all these like girl bosses to look up to and look how great and cool all the barbie girls are and they run the the, the government and they're all doctors and stuff and then you you get older and you encounter like the real world and the, the patriarchy for the first time and all of a sudden it feels like every woman you've ever known is just letting this happen is just like completely falling for it and and that's the angle I've kind of had. And you feel like if you can just yell at them and, and explain how difficult it actually is to be a woman, maybe they'll get it and they'll stop letting this happen. Um, which works in Barbie world. Not so much in our world, but it works in Barbie world. So I, I, I am prepared to go back on, on a, a criticism I had in my initial review. I, I, I think that actually does work i think i was wrong about that one i still think ken bringing the patriarchy to the barbie world was like a pretty obvious direction to go but what are you gonna do stay i mean that doesn't even like 
raise or lower my score. It's still a 9 out of 10. It's still a beautiful, hilarious movie. Uh, I hope Hollywood brings back more practical sets because of the success of this movie. Yeah, I mean, I mean just, again, watch the other video. I talked about this one already. And it's Barbie. Like, who, who cares? Uh, we, we could talk about the Oscars issue. Why was America Ferrera nominated for this movie? Like, I don't think she does bad, but, like, she's nothing. She's just a woman. She's just there. You know? She doesn't, she, she didn't, like, blow me away. Like, if, if, if we're gonna recognize performances for this movie, Margot Robbie, uh, and, and Ryan Gosling, clearly the runaways of this movie, they are the stars, and, you know, they do great in their roles. But even, if we're looking for, like, a supporting actress from Barbie... Kate McKinnon, I would say, does, like, a lot more in this movie, is a far more interesting person, far more interesting character, gives more of an interesting performance in this movie. Why America Ferrera? It just seems random. I think why she was she fine. Is, is Greta Gerwig not being yeah, I don't, I don't know why Greta is not nominated for director, especially when the Oscars has tried so hard to be like, oh, well, we want to, we want to, like, promote female directors, and it's like, okay, Oscars, here is a female director handed to you on a silver platter. You want to take it? You want to do, no? No, you're not going to nominate the super obvious woman director? I don't get the Oscars. They don't make sense. The Oscars are dumb. I got, I got one movie left, and my phone ran out of space. And also, my Adobe was being glitchy on me. I was really worried I was going to lose the audio for this one. Let's talk about the last movie. The best movie of the year. My favorite movie of the year, at least. Yorgos Lanthimos' Poor Things. Second Yorgos Lanthimos movie to be my favorite movie of the year? Um, the favorite was my favorite movie that it came out, and... Um, the, the favorite is definitely still my favorite, uh, Yorgos Lanthimos film, but Poor Things, very close second. I love this movie so much. Like, this is, this is exactly the type of shit I love. You know, like, Frankenstein monsters, uh, autistic baddies, uh, a lot of sex, just a lot of sex. Brilliant movie. Funny movie. Funny movie. Emma Stone gives, like, one of her best performances. Like, she she has to do so much in this movie. Like, there's, there's like, a distinct change that happens with her character throughout the film. And it, it just works. She just does so well in this role. Another weird nomination thing my friend Michael and I were just talking about. Don't know how Mark Ruffalo got supporting actor over Willem Dafoe. Absolutely absurd that Dafoe doesn't have like a million Oscars. He is like one of the greatest living actors. Does great in this movie. Does great in this movie. Um, great makeup and effects in this movie. Uh, I mean, I just, I just love the whole thing. I love the visuals. I, I love, I love the way it's shot. Uh, I love the writing. I love the characters. Uh, uh, my one real gripe with this movie, and it's pretty minor. I think the Paris segment goes on longer than it needs to. I think they could have spent a little less time on the Paris portion of the film, but I don't even. I don't even think they spend, like, way too long on it. I'm like, I would have trimmed this. I don't really mind that they have it. Man, just, like, like a great film. And also, like, very well-reviewed and up for best picture? Like, this is, this is the type of gross, fucked-up thing that the Oscars has just been ignoring for years. I think the only reason this is even on their radar is, A, they know the name Yorgos Lanthimos, and B, critics liked it. I, f I have a strong feeling that a lot of the Academy did not actually watch this film before it received the nomination, because this is absolutely the type of thing they avoid like the plague it's weird to me that this movie is because this this feels like some really niche specific to matt shit this is the type of thing matt loves and everyone else is just like oh this is weird i don't like this i don't i don't want to watch this but i don't know this this one broke through to the mainstream i don't know why this one and not not the other i guess 
I don't know, maybe it is just that this one has something to say, where a lot of films like this that I, I kind of enjoy are just, like, weird and gross for the sake of being weird and gross. This one actually goes somewhere with it. It has something to say. Maybe it's the aesthetic, too. It's It's got a very nice aesthetic. It's, it's, it's like if, if, if Tim Burton made, like, a, a Jess Franco movie. It's like if Jess Franco wrote a script and then handed it off to Tim Burton to direct. That's that's my connection I want to make here. I know Jess Franco is not exactly a household name, but he is to me. I love Jess Franco. I, most of his movies are not good, but I love Jess Franco. God, what do, what else do I even want to say about this movie? Yeah. Poor Things, my favorite movie of 2023. I honestly thought something was gonna top it. I like I saw it and I'm like, this is currently my favorite. I'm sure something could beat it. Nothing has. It just it's my number one movie of the year. Maybe maybe with time I'll find something that came out this year I like better. But as of right now, as of recording this video, Poor Things number one movie of 2023. Thank you for joining me on this like way too long video. Probably this one feels like it was even longer than last year. It's like fuck, how long was I recording? But we're looking at like 2:45 year, two hours and 45 minutes of footage. Probably the the end video will be shorter, but. I don't know, we're, we're still probably looking at a two-hour video. Thanks for sitting through this two-hour video. Until next time, I'm Matt from Matt Presents. Um, have a nice day.